and welcome to My Service Apprentice training. In this session, we're going to talk about logging into My Service Apprentice through the MyServiceForce.com Business Center and talk a little about My Service Apprentice setup. So those two things, logging in and setting up the basic things that you need to know in order to use and effectively use My Service Apprentice. So first, logging in. First place you want to go is to the MyServiceForce.com Business Center, which is www.MyServiceForce.com. And when you go here, you can log in right away along the top by clicking Log In, or you can scroll down to the Software Tools section, and in this case, we're going to use My Service Apprentice. So you click on Sign In. This will bring you to another page, and you'll just want to click Sign In here as well to go to My Service Apprentice. Now, if you're already logged into the MyServiceForce.com Business Center, so up here along the top, if this would have your name, that would indicate that you're logged in, and at that point, if you clicked Sign In, it would go ahead and take you right to the My Service Apprentice user interface. However, if you're not currently logged into the Business Center and you click Sign In, then the system basically just says, hey, you're not signed in yet. It'll take you here and you just enter your email address and password and this will log you in. Something I just thought of is it's important to remember that this login process that we're going over right now is for Office users. If you are using the optional feature for technicians in the field to use our My Service Force mobile application for My Service Apprentice. They would log in on the application and it is different, it's a different type of login than here. So just to clarify that, the login we're doing now is for accessing the office side of My Service Apprentice, which is a standard feature. Once you log in, then you're taken to the My Service Apprentice user interface. We'll call this the My Service Apprentice homepage. You can see right here we have a latest news section. Uh, we'll also have some videos and training available. Over here on the right hand side, we have some support information. These links will be different, well, they, they change from time to time, uh, but this will be where there will be support information and training information accessible. You'll also be able to search our knowledge base. And I encourage you to look around here and um, explore what's there. Okay, so next, let's take a look at setup. Before we get into it, actually doing the setup, let me say a few things. One, Make sure to let your My Service Force contact know of any optional features such as QuickBooks integration or third party work orders like EWOC or IEWOM, uh, if your field techs will be using the mobile application, etc. So make sure to let your My Service Force contact know of any optional features that you asked for or, uh, or want before you start the setup. Uh, just because it, it can affect the setup and we want you to have everything you want uh, right off the bat. So again, make sure to let your, your rep know what you want and if you're not sure uh, or maybe you're not even sure what the optional features are, contact us, let us know and we'll be happy to go over that with you. Second, this setup that we're going over now is based on a standard use, if you will, of My Service Apprentice. What's a standard use? Well, um, standard use is two office users, uh, up to two office users, so one or two office users, and up to three field technicians on the dispatch board, but none of them using the My Service Force mobile application. And then also we're assuming that there's no QuickBooks integration. QuickBooks integration is an optional feature. With all that said, let's go ahead and dive right into actually setting up. I'm going to go through the setup for My Service Apprentice in a certain order, 
you don't necessarily need to do the setup in this order, but I find this the more or the most logical way to do it. So if you're not sure how to do it, then do it this way. Okay, first thing we'll look at is the company maintenance. So if you go up here to the top menus, uh, go to more, down to maintenance, and you'll notice I'm just mousing over or hovering with my mouse pointer over these items and if there is a sub menu once I hover over the sub menu will appear and when I hover over something in the sub menu or a sub menu does not appear that means it's a destination link if you will and you click on it to get to that page so company is the first one we're looking at I'll click on company and you'll notice uh, maybe maybe you didn't notice, but I'll point it out that the employee page, or I'm sorry, the company page right here, it opened up in another tab. We on purpose we keep the My Service Apprentice homepage open, so you always um, know it's there and you can go back to it. Whether you want to access one of the other links here, uh, or you need to reference something here in the knowledge base or the support section. So uh, that is by design that we open up um, any link that's accessed from the My Service Apprentice homepage that will open up the destination in a new tab. Okay, so we're looking at company here. This will be filled out or, or populated, is the fancy word, with your company information on setup. I will suggest that you check this just to make sure everything's uh, correct and uh, things change. So if you ever need to come back here, update your address, update a phone number, um, and go ahead and do that. And obviously, once you've finished doing that, click on save and that will save it. So that's company setup. Next thing we'll look at is the employee setup. So I'll go back up here to more, again, down to maintenance. And before I go to employee, let me look, let's take a look at branch. You may not be able to tell, but the word branch is slightly grayed out. When you click on anything like this, that indicates that it's a, an optional feature in My Service Apprentice. So you'll see here, this is not a standard feature in My Service Apprentice. Contact My Service Force for more information. So we keep the links there for the optional features. And if you do click on any of them, you'll get this message. If you don't want to consider that optional feature, fine, just say OK. But if you are interested, that's a great time to make a note of that or just let us know right away. You can go up here to our online chat, uh, live chat option. You can ask about it on the spot if, uh, if you want to do that. OK, so let's go back here. Again, we're going to employee. So this is the employee setup two types of employees. There are the office employees and then the field technicians. As I said earlier, we're assuming the standard use, which is up to two office users and up to three field technicians. Um, if the, the office users, um, they will also need to have a business center login, so you'll want to get that information um, to the to your my service force representative and that's usually done uh, in the very beginning so if you need to change a user change an office user you'll want to email um, or chat in to your representative and let them know uh, what email address you're going to be using for the office user field technicians you can set these up on your own and um, I have these three set up if you want to add another user, uh, let's say you're, you're at your max of three and you want to add a fourth. If you click on new, it will let you know that you've reached your limit uh, and you would need to purchase another user. And you could work that out with your, uh, with your rep or uh, with our online chat. If you want to edit a current user, you'll just come in here and uh, click on the radio button or the circle next to that user, click modify, and then you can modify uh, all the information here. I'll point out down below here we have the 
dispatch window. This has to do with technicians that are using the mobile device application. So if you're not using that optional feature, you don't need to even be concerned about this, and I'm not going to cover that in this training. Uh, so for maintaining an employee, really, you're just looking at the employee name, um, the employee title, and, and the address and phone numbers. And of course, when you save that, you'll save it. It'll take you back to the previous screen. To delete an employee, select the button or the radio button or, or circle, click delete, and that will delete that employee. And the password has to do with if your technicians are using the mobile application in the field. So to add a new employee, if you need to add any, click on new. And like I said, if you've reached your maximum, it'll prompt you and let you know uh, that you've reached your maximum. But creating an employee is pretty straightforward. Give a login ID. The login ID is what's going to appear along the top of the dispatch board. So let's say your technician's name is Steve something or other. Um, say Steve Robinson. Maybe you'll want to give a login ID of Steve R. And that will that is what will appear along the top of the dispatch board. And for the employee name, obviously, you would want to go ahead and put in Steve Robinson. And you will need to put in a password even if the user is not using the mobile application. So if you're not using the mobile application, you can just put in something very basic. Um, and uh, employee ID is not necessary. You can skip over that. The employee type, this is the important part. So if you're setting up a technician, you definitely want to make sure to select technician. You can put in a title if you want. You don't need to. You can skip the branch. Obviously, put in the address, city, state, zip code, and put in any phone numbers. And the dispatch window along the bottom, again, if you're not using the mobile application, you can just skip right over that save it after you check your information and that's all there is to creating a technician once you create a technician then that technician will appear on the dispatcher the next piece we'll look at with respect to setup is your customers and sites so I'll click on the customer sites link now let me say you may have no setup to do here for your customers if you want to start entering customers, uh, maybe you have a list of customers that you want to manually enter, you can go ahead and do that. Um, if you've done a data import, let's say you uh, exported data from another source, maybe an Excel spreadsheet or another uh, system that you were using, and we worked with you to Im import that, that information would appear here. So I guess really this isn't as much a setup option or a setup item, um, but I'll go over this with you and just show you entering a customer. So you might be thinking, well, what's I understand customers, but what's what's this site business all about? Well, let me explain. In our system, uh, we need to have obviously customers, and then under each customer, there must be at least one site. So let's take uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this one Douglas Whitaker well this is a residential customer so we uh, we have the customer and then under that customer we have just one site the site being where we're going to do the work and uh, the work order actually gets created underneath the site Let's go back to the customer list and take a look at Pizza Shack. Well, Pizza Shack, um, they have one main office or one main uh, pizza shop. Maybe they would have another one. Well, in that case, we could create another site under Pizza Shack for their other shop, in maybe on the other side of town or in a different town or even on the other side of the country if, if we wanted to. We could do the same thing for 
uh, any residential customer. So let's say the initial one we looked at here, Douglas Whitaker, where maybe he has a rental property. We could create another site under there, under the rental property, and uh, we could have everything build to him at his main property and then list the rental property as a site under there. So let's go ahead and go through the steps of creating a brand new customer. I'll click on new and we'll just go right through here. Customer name. I'll just enter this information. You can enter a contact name if you want to. You can skip the branch. And the address, we'll just say it's 123 Market Street. Billing City, let's choose Allentown, Pennsylvania. Great, so there's the billing address. If this is a if this is residential, well, the billing and the shipping more than likely are going to be the same. So all I have to do is click on that little checkbox. Saves some time entering information. Of course, you would want to enter any phone numbers. And uh, one thing I would say is if you have a mobile number for the customer, make sure you put the mobile number in the mobile field. You can put in an email address and. I'll go ahead and put in our support email address, support at myserviceforce.com. And then any notes about the customer. Uh, so maybe if the customer has a big dog on the property or just something uh, that might pertain or something that would pertain to this customer, you could go ahead and put that in there. And okay, something like that whatever applies. If nothing applies, then that's fine. If you need to make this field bigger, you can always click and expand that. And that will hold uh, a sufficient amount of text. So we have the customer information in there. And when we're entering a brand new customer, it will also prompt to create a site. So let's say it's going to be the same information, same billing and shipping address, we could click that and it's going to fill that in and we could give it a site name, but in most cases in a residential scenario, we're going to call this the default site. And if you click on that, it's going to fill everything out. That just means the default site means that the billing and the shipping address are the same and the site is the customer and that's where we're going. So you click that and that's just going to fill everything in and save you a whole bunch of typing there. You can also track lead sources. I won't go over this in our typical setup here, but if, if you are using lead sources, uh, and you will be able to select a lead source. So if you're tracking where your customers are coming from, you can uh, choose that there. So you click on save and now we have our customer in there and we could go ahead and, and get started creating work orders. If you want to create another site, let's say this person has a rental property uh, or just some other site they want you to service, creating an additional site, very simple. You drill down to the customer details and underneath the customer sites table, just click on new and go through the steps of adding a site. Give it a site name. The billing address by default is going to stay the same and all you need to do is put in the address and phone numbers and any notes pertaining to that site. Save it and then you would have your site. The next item we'll look at is setting up your inventory or your billable items if you will. So I'll go right here to the inventory link and this page looks a little different. Uh, this is where you're going to enter the items that you will want to put on your invoices. If your technicians are using our mobile application in the field, 
the items you put here will be available to them in the mobile application as well to build their tickets and invoices. So you can categorize your items if you'd like to. So in my example here I have a category, a one category of materials and you can put categories under that category, so subcategories underneath a, a category if you want to. Uh, I don't have any subcategories under materials, but you can see here based on the little uh, tree that under materials I have some items, but I also have an example here of items that are not in a category. So you don't have to use categories uh, if you have uh, really, if you only have a few items, you may not even want to consider using categories. And I've seen users use just a, a very limited number of items, such as labor parts and miscellaneous. Now I'm going to show you how to actually create an invoice item. First take note that I have the materials subcategory highlighted. The, the top gonzo here, if you will, is, that's the root. So this is a, an ID that represents my database, and you would have one as well. Uh, and if you don't have any subcategories, you would see the ID representing your, co your company. And if you have subcategories, obviously, then you're going to see the little folders underneath. But again, I have materials highlighted. To create a new item, just click New Item. That'll bring up a different screen here. And just go top to bottom. So select from the standard list here of items. And we'll call this a non-inventory item. Really, whatever, whatever applies for you. And uh, I'll call this a widget. You just type in this information. Type in a standard description that you want, or a default description. I'll just call this a standard widget, whatever that is. Unit, you can skip over that. And category name, this is where whatever category you have highlighted over here on the left is going to appear. So that's why I pointed out that I had materials highlighted. This by default then is going to put this item in the materials subcategory. If you see the wrong category there, no problem, you don't have to redo what you did. You can just click on change and then so from the window that would pop up, select the appropriate category and create it there. Cost, if you want to track your cost for this item, you can do that, but I'm going to leave that blank for now. And your price, uh, this is going to be the default price that shows up when you create an invoice. So let's say you want the default price of this to be $50. We can go ahead and do that. If you have an item, like a catch-all item, I always suggest creating an item called, say, miscellaneous, uh, something like that. Something that if you come across something you need to put on, on an invoice, you can always use that catch-all item. In a case like that, you'd probably want to keep the default price at zero and then change the price every time you use it. Um, you know, depending on what you're charging for that particular item. The next line, price as a percentage. This is really most applicable if you're using a discount item. So let's say you give a 5% discount in certain cases or a 10% discount, whatever. You could create a discount item, and in that case, you would want to say the price as a percentage. But in most cases, you'll just want to leave that set at no. And then is this item taxable or not taxable? If it's labor, in most cases, that's going to be non-taxable. And uh, if it's uh, materials or parts, you'd want to say taxable. So I'll go ahead and, and say taxable. Now, disclaimer here, uh, we, are, we cannot give you any tax advice. So if you have any questions relating to whether something should be taxed or not taxed, then um, want to consult with your uh, accounting professional on that. But in this case, I'm going to say it's taxable. I can double check everything here. OK, great. It all looks good. I'll save it. And there's my item. And you'll notice my widget appears over here on the left-hand side. If you want to check what you did, click on that. 
and that'll show the details of the item over here. If you want to edit, maybe you want to edit the description or change the category or the price, just click on edit and then you'd be able to edit that information and then save it. If you want to create categories or subcategories, then the process is a little different than creating items. Let's say we want to create a category under uh, under the root. Okay, so just a just a first level category. We'll call it that. Something uh, similar to materials. You would first want to click on the ID representing your company, and that will show any subcategories or any categories that you currently have. So our materials appears right here. But we want to add a, another category in addition to materials. I'll add, I'll click on add new, and just type in a name for your next category. I'll just call this training category. Save it. And there you have a category. So creating categories is pretty straightforward. If you want to edit the name of the category, uh, made a typo or something like that, you can click on edit. If your category is empty, you can delete it. Notice delete right here for the materials category is not active. That link is not active, meaning there are items inside there and you can't delete that. So uh, this category is empty. Um, you can delete that if you want to. You can also create categories within categories, so subcategories of categories. And if you want to do that, it's a very similar process. You would just need to drill down within that category or open the next level. And now it's showing the materials. The materials category is highlighted on the left hand side. And over here is showing the categories within that folder, within that category. So you definitely do not need to break your folders down even more. But if you want to, it's there. And the process is just the same as creating a category. Um, click on Add New, and you can create any number of subcategories. Next, we'll look at tax rates, so setting up your taxes. If you're on the inventory screen or the dispatch board, you would want to look for the main menu button and click on tax rates. From anywhere else, the standard interface, you'd go up here to more, down to setup, and go to tax rates. So there's a couple different ways to get to uh, the tax rate page and other pages for that matter. But once you get here, you can set up your tax rates. Now, we do have some customers that say, hey, I don't charge tax. I pay ch tax up front when I get the parts. And, um, uh, and other customers are in states that don't charge any sales tax. If you're in a case like that, you will want to set up at least one tax item, because uh, you do need to have a tax item on an invoice. Now. It's very easy to do. Set it up, and, and in your case, if you're not charging tax, just create a tax and call it no tax and give it an amount of zero. And I'll show you that. Um, most people will be setting up just one tax rate. Certain states, you'll need to set up many. You can do that. So let me go through, and I'll show you how to set up uh, a tax rate. Let's take the case of if you need to set up or want to set up a zero tax item. You can do that and the, to do that click on new. Just put in the tax name. We'll just call this one no tax. If this was your state sales tax you could just type in state sales tax or Wisconsin sales, sales tax whatever. The tax description it may be the same exact thing as the tax name and that's fine. You can just go ahead and type the same thing in there or something different if you want to. If this is a non-zero tax, then you could put the tax amount in there. In this case, though, we're just making it a zero tax. And 
the number of decimal points that you want this calculated out to. So we'll say two zero. That's your your standard two decimal points to the right of the des of the decimal point. That's your standard answer. Is this your default tax? So if you only have one tax, whether it be the zero tax or whether it be an actual state tax, if you only have one probably a good idea to say yeah this is the default tax so whenever you create an invoice you won't even need to select the tax because you've said this is the default I want this one used every time I create an invoice now if you let's say you have multiple taxes and you do have a default picked because you use a certain tax 90% or 95% of the time um, you could have that tax put on there as the default and then manually change it on each invoice and that's something that'll make a lot more sense once you actually get into creating invoices but um, our goal here was to create a tax rate very simple I'll double check what I did here yep looks good click on save and my tax is created let's say a tax rate changes or you notice there's a typo somewhere in your sales tax to edit pretty standard across the system select the circle or radio button next to that item click on modify modify it however you wish and then click on save I'll just go back here of course to delete same kind of thing select the one you want to delete click on delete it'll ask are you sure say yes and then that's deleted next we'll take a look at adding equipment types so I'll go up here to more down to setup and equipment type click on that and these are my types of equipment so you can track different pieces of equipment at job sites so you may, you may choose not to do this depending on your business or just depending on how you want to use the system but let's say you want to track uh, certain items that you service at a person's home or job location whether it's uh, residential or commercial this is where you would want to put the types of equipment or the type of equipment so if you're an air conditioner contractor uh, it might be blower units or you know central air units um, um, air handlers things like that if you're a plumber maybe you'd want to track toilets or sinks or really whatever you can be creative here as well and and put in whatever you'd like to track so to create a category very straightforward click on new enter the name enter the name of the category click save and that's all there is to it pretty straightforward there similarly or similar to equipment types is call types now there's a difference because equipment types you don't have to use however call types you must use so I'm just going to more setup and then call type call types are needed in order to create work orders now you'll have some standard call types in your system more than likely already you can edit those or you can create your own and if you'd like to create your own again very straightforward before we create one let's just take a look at these so I have no AC this uh, uh, this is you know, a, a hypothetical air conditioning contractor so um, we'll call this call type or this was called no AC I gave this a high priority and I gave it an estimated duration of two hours so if you just look down through I have different call types and each has its own priority and its own estimated duration so keep that in mind as we create the next call type so I'll click on new and you would just enter your call type name and then select the priority and then select or enter the estimated duration so maybe it's something that typically takes an hour so you just put in one hour 
You could always make it an hour and 30 minutes if you'd want. And then save it. And then once you save it, you would be brought back to this list and you'd see something like this. You'd have your call type name, the priority, and the estimated duration. Now, both the priority and the estimated duration can be modified when you create a work order. And that's when call types are used. Call types are used when you create a work order. So if you create a work order with this no AC call type, by default, that work order would have a priority of high and, and an estimated duration of two hours. Now, let's say you needed to change the priority for that particular work order. You can easily do it. Same thing with the estimated duration. You can easily change that. And that'll make a whole lot more sense once you actually are creating work orders. Um, the priority and the estimated durations are really just suggestions, defaults that you put in for when you're creating your work orders. And that covers the basic setup of what you need to get going with My Service Apprentice. If you have any questions, I'll remind you we have our live online chat, so you can chat into us uh, and ask us any questions. You can always email us at support at myserviceforce.com. And remember right here, all our support information Often, answers to your questions are just a few clicks away. Uh, you can also search our knowledge base. And let me just mention one last thing. There are a lot of things that we didn't touch on today, especially under the setup links. And if you click on something that is not a standard option or something, uh, an option that, uh, that you currently haven't subscribed to or chosen, you'll get this message a great time to contact us on the on online chat to ask more about that specific feature if it's something you're interested in. So next, we're going to go over how to really get working with My Service Apprentice, so let's go.